Um, welcome. Um, I'm Rod Quillitz. I'm the Clinical Pharmacy Coordinator for Infectious Disease and Antimicrobial Stewardship across the street at H.M. Moffitt Cancer Center. And for the new fellows, welcome. And I will be um, spending a fair amount of time with you guys throughout, throughout your time with us. Um, today I'm going to present on febrile neutropenia and to try to make the title sound a little more interesting. I added in the 21st century, which, you know, for those of us born in the 60s, the 21st century sounded sci-fi at one time, you know. Okay, showing my age here. Okay. So, um, what are we going to talk about? I'm briefly going to review the risk factors for infections on oncology patients focusing on neutropenia uh, and mucositis. We're going to discuss prominent bacterial fungal viral pathogens which cause infections in immunocompromised cancer patients and review some of the antimicrobial options to either prevent or treat these, these um, infections, these high-risk patients. Some key resources that I recommend uh, everyone who's interested in this field get a hold of. The uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Network has clinical practice guidelines on prevention and treatment of infections in cancer patients available at nccn.org. Org. Um, so that's updated at least annually and often more. So I highly recommend a copy of that, easily to obtain from the internet. Um, one, of the, one of our staple Bibles, if you will, is the uh, clinical practice guidelines from the Infectious Disease Society of America focusing on neutropenic cancer patients. Also, though, it's important to know that there are other guidelines out there, such as the European uh, Consortium Guidelines for Empiric Antibiotic therapy for febrile neutropenia in an age of growing resistance. So I highly recommend this article as a reference. And an excellent article talking about the importance of the mucosal barrier injury in what we tend to think of as neutropenic fever. Some people are calling neutropenic mucositis. More about that in just a minute. So one thing you'll hear from oncologists um, is our patients are different. And there's some truth to that, right? Um, so, for example, patient, patients are at maybe at an increased risk of encapsulated organisms due to hypogammaglobulinemia, which is something that we can see in our chronic lymphocytic leukemia patients or our multiple myeloma patients. Um, we have patients who have advanced refractory solid tumors, which set patients up for infectious complications due to anatomic factors, right? So if the tumor is outgrowing the blood supply, it can become necrotic. This large necrotic tumor can get secondarily infected, but can also mimic infection by causing a leukemoid reaction. Uh, basically, you can wind up with the tumor secreting um, colony stimulating factors and other cytokines, which can cause a, you know, profound elevation in white blood cell count, can cause fever, and again, can be confused for infection. Also, if you have an uh, endobronchial tumor, this can compress on the lungs and set your patient up for obstructive pneumonia. Similar concept, if you have an abdominal tumor, this can compress on the, on the kidneys and set your patient up for pyelonephritis or um, on the biliary tree and set your patient up for cholangitis. Um, infection, um, tumors can invade through the colonic mucosa. This can set patients up for either bacterial translocation, even the abscess, absence of neutropenia, or local abscess formation. Also, when we aggressively resect these tumors, we can wind up with anastomotic leaks, right? So, if you, for example, pancreatic cancer patients can wind up leaking pancreatic contents, both in both um, bacterial yeast and also pancreatic enzymes into the peritoneum, which can cause both infectious and chemical peritonitis. Um, patients who have esophageal cancer can develop an esophageal leak after their surgery, which can lead to a mediastinitis. I'll, you know, these, many of these patients have central venous catheters, which is a great site for infection. Um, Any time, basically, that we disrupt the, the skin, the GI tract, sinopulmonary GU tracts due to chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery, we risk invasion by local flora. And then, of course, neutropenia. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, because, but it's worth mentioning that the, the, the stem cell transplant patients which are divided into two categories, right? Autologous, where you're getting your own cells back, or allogeneic, where you're getting um, stem cells from a donor. The allogeneic stem cell transplant patients are uh, particularly high risk for infection because early on they have the same risk factors for infection in the pre engraftment period that we we're going to talk about in terms of neutropenia and combination with mucositis, putting them at risk for bacterial infections, 
translocating from the gut as well as reactivation of herpes simplex virus. Um, but as they, these patients can have post engraftment complications as well because they're receiving agents to either prevent or treat graft virus host disease. These have negative effects on, on lymphocyte activity. Um, so therefore we can see opportunistic infections such as cytomegalovirus. We can see varicella zoster virus reactivations. We can see Epstein-Barr virus post-transplant lymphoperiphery disease. We, we can see uh, as aspergillus either from neutropenia or from, or from impaired lymphocyte function, candida species, pneumocystis, toxoplasmosis, etc. That's really its own separate lecture, so I better keep moving. So what do we mean when we say neutropenia? It's important that we understand these definitions, right? The IDSA guidelines define neutropenia as an absolute neutrophil count of less than 500 cells per, uh, mil per cubic millimeter or an ANC that is expected to decrease to less than 500 within the next 48 hours. And, you, you know, in terms of the expectation, that means you've given somebody cytotoxic chemotherapy and you see their counts dropping. So you can guesstimate that there'll be you know, ANC will be less than 500 within 48 hours. Um, the single most important risk factor for infection following chemotherapy is neutropenia slash in combination with muc mucositis, but we're going to hit on that in a second. We talk about severe um, neutropenia, we talk about an ANC less than 100 or profound neutropenia. And 10 to 20 percent of patients who develop profound neutropenia following cytotoxic chemotherapy will develop a bloodstream infection. Also, if you have a rapid decline in your ANC or a prolonged duration of your neutropenia, particularly this, the profound neutropenia, um, these patients are at increased risk of infection and they have uh, impaired bone marrow reserve. Also, there's the concept of being functionally neutropenic. Um, definitely in quotations, but uh, patients who have active hemolignancies have impaired uh, neutrophil function. So you may have reduced phagocytosis and pathogen killing, and these patients are at relatively increased risk of infection despite having a quote-unquote non-neutropenic uh, neutrophil count. Still better to have neutrophils even if they're kind of screwy than not have neutrophils, but nonetheless. Now, I don't like to talk about neutropenia anymore without talking immediately about mucosal barrier injury, because the two things are intrinsically linked in terms of infection risk. So in the article that I mentioned previously, I really encourage you to read, but I'm going to kind of summarize some of the key take-home points. So cytotoxic chemotherapy causes both neutropenia and mucositis, mucosal barrier injury. Febrile mucositis is at least as relevant to infection risk as febrile neutropenia. And MBI is a multi-step inflammatory process. So early on, you have activation of nuclear factor kappa B directly from chemotherapy or XRT effects, indirectly from formation of reactive oxygen species and DNA and non-DNA damage. You have production and release of cytokines and chemokines by tissue macrophages, dendritic cells, and epithelial cells like IL-1 beta, IL interleukin-6, interleukin-8, tumor necrosis factor alpha, um, interleukin-23, inter interferon gamma. This results in a positive feedback loop of TNF, epithelial cell apoptosis, and increased mucosal permeability. And so what this does is it creates, we go from this nice picture to the left to this messy picture to the right, right? So we have all this inflammation and damage to the mucosal barrier. This results in the risk for translocation of, of uh, bacteria and yeast from the GI tract with associated pathogen, associated molecular patterns or paths. But you can also, ha you can also have a ton of inflammation here. Even in the absence of infection, you have an up um, a increased re release in the appearance of a variety of cytokines, chemokines called DAMPs, danger-associated molecular patterns. This means that you can, that you can have, you, you can have a neutropenic fever that is, that is, due to an active infection, due to a translocated organism, you can also have neutropenic fever that's strictly due to the inflammation caused by the damage that the chemotherapy has done to the mucosal barrier. Um, and we can't really tell the difference at a glance, right? So what we have to do is treat these patients aggressively initially as a presumed bacteremia um, also, some interesting kind of side notes, um, like Streptococcus mitis oralis and coagulase negative Staphylococcus. 
uh, reside on mucosal um, barriers. This is probably where the alpha hemolytic streptococcal syndrome with septic shock and ARDS, it may actually be more the mucosal barrier injury that's the real player here. And the strep mitis oralis is almost a marker for this, for this highly inflammatory damage. I mean, obviously we had to treat it and we treat it and we very, very quickly clear the bloodstream of strep mitis oralis, but we can still see the ARDS, for example, progressing, even though the, even in a situation where the bloodstream has been cleared for days of streptococcus. Coagulase negative staph, we always think about that as being a likely contaminant and it often is, but it doesn't always come from the central lines. It can actually be GI translocation from the gut as well. Um, okay. And of course, sepsis um, is associated with aerobic gram negative rods, intercoxi, and candidemia that translocate. Um, but probably one of the most common causes of fever in patients with neutropenia and mucositis is, in fact, um, the actual inflammation itself, the DAF associated um, fevers. And this is a nice little um, this, uh, diagram showing that as intestinal damage increases, at the same time that neutrophils are dropping, you have this period of risk, um, and particularly around day, say, um, 10 to about uh, 20 or so, which is post-chemotherapy, which is probably like where you're, you have the overlap, the perfect storm of, of neutropenia and mucosal damage. This is where we see most of our fever. This is where we see most of our bacterial translocation as well. Okay. So what's our definition of fever, uh, at least in the intrapenic fever guidelines? A single oral temperature of greater than or equal to 38 degrees Celsius, i.e. 101 degrees Fahrenheit, or oral temperatures in the 38 to 32, 38, 38 to 38.2 degrees Celsius, or 100.4 to 100.9 degrees Fahrenheit, which persists for an hour or longer. So in other words, if you have a patient who has, who's neutropenic, and they have a temperature of 100.7, then they should be evaluated. They should also have a, re, they should also have a repeat uh, uh, temperature checked in an hour to see if that's persisting. Um, obviously, if the patient has other signs or symptoms of infection, you treat them. But in a patient who's otherwise essentially asymptomatic, you're going to actually, you, then you will go by the numbers. So over the years, there have there have been significant changes in the in the relative in the relative uh, or, or incidences of gram positive versus gram negative organisms uh, due to a variety of risk factors. So and uh, so most you know so uh, most recently the well, we've seen a phenomena where we had predominantly gram negative organisms translocating from the GI tract. But then we started putting central venous catheters in every once, and now we started to see more gram-positive infections, while simultaneously we started fluoroquinolone prophylaxis, which at least transiently caused a significant drop in the incidence of gram-negative rods translocating from the gut. So you saw in the 1990s a big spike of gram-positive compared to gram-negatives. Also, vancomy vancomycin-resistant enterococcus started to pop up, and that also uh, became a factor. Now what we're seeing is the gram-negative rods making a comeback because they're particularly E. coli and Klebs yellow, but any number of gram-negative rods are increasing their um, resistance to the fluoroquinolones, and therefore we're seeing more um, fluoroquinolone-resistant E. coli, Klebs yellow, Intrabacter, even Pseudomonas breaking through uh, ciprofloxacin and prophylaxis or levocone prophylaxis. So what are the consequences? Well, neutropenic fever... This reference mentioned a 10 to 50% incidence in patients with solid tumors. In 2017, that's way inflated, right? So it's certainly less than 10%, probably more like 5 to 10%, depending on the regimen. But most of the um, high-risk neutropenic fever regimens are those for the patients with hematological malignancies, leukemia, lymphoma, etc. Um, and infections are documented about 20 to 30 percent of neutropenic fever uh, episodes, of which 10 to 25 percent of the uh, of these patients with neutropenic fever have bacteremia. So this tends to be the most common, and predominantly due to bacterial translocation. And we do have to treat neutropenic fever as a medical emergency, 
Um, and the guidelines recommend urgent empiric antibiotic therapy within two hours of presentation to prevent progression to sepsis. Uh, antimicrobial prophylaxis can reduce the risk of infections in high-risk patients at the risk of uh, fostering resistance and or giving you some early C. diff colitis, right? Okay. This, you know, and this, you know, and since we're talking about the 21st century, we have to talk about bacterial resistance. And, um, you know, back when we started, first started learning about how to manage neutropenic fever patients, you know, overall mortality could be as high as 21%, but the institution of early empiric um, broad spectrum coverage substantially reduced that incidence down to the 2 to 10% range. But now we have organisms with extended spectrum beta lactamases, right? So ESBL positive gram negative rod bacteremia in heme malignancy patients increases overall mortality by 25% compared to ESBL negative bacteria. So we're less likely to give an active therapy promptly, right? Also, the mortality rate for um, carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae bacteremia in neutropenic cancer patients has been reported to be as high as 69%. Hopefully we can make some progress on that, but that, that, that was the, those were the numbers that were quoted in 2013. Um, and CRE, bacterial colonization infection, are on the rise worldwide. Not to pick on the Indian subcontinent because we have enough problems in the U.S., but it's pretty impressive that greater than 100 million people in that continent are already colonized with carbapenem-resistant gram-negative rods, and that was four years ago. Um, okay, and this is what we're really worried about, right? So if we can't give... If these things become endemic and we lose the ability to give effective antibacterial treatment for um, multidrug-resistant bacterial infections in patients receiving cancer treatment, then can we even give them these treatments safely, right? So that's why we need antimicrobial stewardship, why we need to be, why we need to be very aware that we can't be total wild, wild west with um, antibiotics in cancer patients, right? Okay. Let's talk about low versus high risk neutropenic fever. So low risk are going to be your patients with this shorter duration of neutropenia, have minimal comorbid conditions, um, and or have a mask score of greater than or equal to 21. And these are candidates for potential oral or outpatient therapy. Uh, a mask score is the Multinational Association for Supportive Care in Cancer Risk Index Score. So you add up these factors and it can help determine your patient's risk. We generally don't do this by the numbers, but these are the kind of factors that we are considering, right? Um, the majority of patients that we see are going to be considered the high-risk patients who are going to be admitted for IV antibiotics. So low risk can actually be treated with um, amoxicillin and ciprofloxacin. A quick word about low risk, though, before I, before I leave it, is that you have to have a system Right? You have to be able to monitor those patients, particularly on the first day. You have to be able to bring those patients in daily for at least a few days to be monitored very closely. And you have to make sure they have a 24-7 caregiver and that they're, you know, relatively close to your institution within an hour. And you have the right people to, to, to manage and monitor these patients. That's why a lot of low-risk patients do wind up being treated aggressively because if you don't have the, if you don't have the logistics in place. High risk, the IDSA guidelines recommend monotherapy with an anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam. So, so they specifically mentioned cefepime, piperacillin, tazobactam, and the carbapenems, dorapenem, imipenem, or mirapenem, not erdapenem, because erdapenem lacks anti-pseudomonal activity. And we want that in our empiric coverage. Um, most, most patients with neutropenic fever can be treated with monotherapy. Um, not everyone needs vancomycin added, like most, like I saw a lot when I started out. Um, but some patients do, right? Patients who have hemodynamic instability or other evidence of severe sepsis. Um, the, idea, the guidelines state if patients have documented uh, pneumonia, um, that you should consider vancomycin. You can also consider whether the patient's versus screen negative or positive as the risk for for um, MRSA pneumonia in a patient with a MRSA negative nasal screen is remote, but it's an, it is certainly to be, something to be considered in the guidelines. Positive uh, blood cultures for gram-positive bacteria before you have 
identification susceptibility. That's kind of a common sense maneuver. Clinically suspected serious catheter related infections or any kind of skin or soft tissue infection at any site at the time of neutrophilic fever. Colonization with uh, MRSA or penicillin resistant streptococcal pneumoniae. Um, VRE, I want to talk about that separately here. Also, severe mucositis um, is mentioned if fluoroquinolone prophylaxis has been given and ceftazidime is employed as empiric therapy. Does anyone know why they call out this scenario? Ceftazidime in a patient with severe mucositis and fluoroquinolone prophylaxis, what organism they're worried about us missing with ceftazidime? Yes, Streptococcus um, mitis aralis, because it has been associated with ARDS and even a, a, a streptococcal shock syndrome. Ceftazidime has poor streptococcus um, viridens activity. Um, okay, but cefepime and piperacillin-tazobactam, substantially better, right? Let's talk about VRE a little bit. Um, so there was a meta-analysis of 34 studies and over 8,000 cancer patients that showed about 20% of cancer patients have are very colonized in the modern age, unfortunately, when you look for it. About 24% of the hemolignancy patients are about the same. Colonized patients were about 24 times more likely to develop VRE uh, bacteremia than non-colonized patients, which makes sense since it's a translocation phenomenon. Largely because of this kind of information, the Infectious Society of America and the NCCN guidelines recommend empiric daptomycin, and dose should be at least 8 mg per kg per day, or linazolid um, in VRE colonized patients with first neutropenic fever. And they recommend to reassess the need for continued gram positive agents after 48 to 72 hours. There's actually some debate. About, about this recommendation, however, because empiric use of linazolid in 100 febrile VRE colonized hemoc and BMT patients demonstrated no impact on mortality. What mattered for mortality was whether the patient had persistent neutropenia or the patient had uh, graft host disease for the subset that were status post allogeneic stem cell transplant. And, if, and this, this article specifically looked at BMT patients and what they found is um, about 9% of BMT patients who are VRE colonized developed VRE bacteremia pre-engraftment. Uh, they had similar outcomes to patients who had, who had other um, bac bacteremias. Let's see right there. Uh, however, patients who had post-engraftment bacteremia, which was about 9% of patients, they, um, they had, they had a... Uh, substantially increased mortality. And these, it's because these patients were almost inevitably had severe graft host disease uh, and, or, or they had um, refractory um, leukemia. So that these were the factors, probably more so than the actual, it was more a marker for, for these high risk conditions than actually the cause of the increased mortality. So, we have actually moved away from using um, uh, anti-VRE therapy in our VRE colonized patients in our acute leukemics um, for this reason. We actually have some internal house data that we'll be publishing soon that's also supported that it didn't that we didn't see a difference in, in outcomes depending on whether the patients got therapy within 24 hours or if it was slightly delayed for the re, for, for the culture results to come back. Yes, we had our, we have encountered daptomycin resistant um, VRE. And certainly linazole resistant VRE is also well described in the literature as well. Okay, when do we want to give additional, shifting gears to gram negative coverage, when do we want to give additional gram negative coverage? Or for the guidelines, when do we add aminoglycosides or fluoroquinolones? Obviously, if you gave fluoroquinolone prophylaxis, you're not going to be adding fluoroquinolones. Um, but um, if your patient's hemodynamically unstable, has positive cultures for gram-negative rod bacteremia, um, and if patients have had recent history of multidrug-resistant gram-negative rod infection, assuming that it was susceptible to aminoglycosides, um, then you should also reevaluate re the need for this ex 
expanded gram-negative coverage in 48 to 72 hours, as we discussed with the gram-positives. Um, typically, we do not need uh, anaerobic coverage. Um, anaerobes make a very small percentage of positive cultures in febrile neutropenic patients, but there are a couple exceptions. If you have a patient with neutropenic enterocolitis, also known as teflitis, right, these patients have severe right lower quadrant abdominal pain. And here, if we would add metronidazole if, if the patient is on cefepime, for example. Um, but if the patient's on piperacillin tazobactam or carapenem, then we already have excellent anaerobic coverage and we will not need to add it. And of course, if we're suspecting or treating Clostridium um, difficile colitis, we'll need metronidazole or oral vancomycin or fidexomycin, I suppose. Okay. Um, and when do we add or expand antifungal therapy in these patients? So the IDSA recommends for patients who remain hemodynamically unstable after initial doses with standard agents for neutropenic fever should have their antimicrobial regimen broadened. So yes, you know, resistant gram-negative rods, so we, you know, these patients might wind up on a carbapenem. Um, gram-positive coverage, we mentioned these patients would get um, vancomycin uh, or uh, anti-VRE therapy if they were unstable and they were colonized. Uh, we would consider anaerobic coverage if... Uh, our patients are at risk, and fungus, right? And in this setting, we're primarily worried about candida, right? So options that were mentioned in the IDSA guidelines for neutropenic fever mentioned fluconazole, but I will mention that the candidiasis guidelines would not recommend fluconazole first line in the setting of a hemodynamically unstable patient. So I should put a line through that, right, and say a kind of candens or liposomal amphotericin B. Empiric antifungal therapy should be considered in high-risk patients who have persistent fevers after four to seven days of broad-spectrum antibiotic regimens and no identified fever source. And now we're worried about both candida and mold, and particularly aspergillus, right, as possibilities in this patient who clearly also is not recovering their counts promptly, right? So a controversial area, de-escalation in, in neutropenics. Okay. The IDSA guidelines recommend if patients have positive cultures that they, we modify to the, the initial antimicrobial regimen um, and it should be guided by clinical and microbiologic data. And they actually do say that it can be appropriately narrowed to specifically treat the defined infection once the patient say febrile. That's where they stop because there's a lot of controversial there. Like, okay, well, if, if the organism is susceptible to ampicillin, we just switch the patient to ampicillin or would you also want antihistamine prophylaxis? It's a um, it's an area that they don't they don't specifically get into. Um, the NCCN guidelines really kind of skirt this issue entirely, and they don't really recommend de-escalating from antihistamine therapy once the patient's had intravenous fever and, until the ANC is greater than 500 and increasing. And if patients have negative cultures, the traditional approach is to continue broad spectrum antibiotics until the patient's a febrile for at least two days and ANC greater than 500. And this is all great if your patient's eminently going to re recover their neutrophil count, right? But it's not so great in an acute leukemic who may still be neutropenic two, three, four weeks from now. Okay. Now, the uh, European Consortium uh, guidelines actually recommend if patients have a positive culture, de-escalate to a narrower spectrum therapy based on susceptibility profile. They, say, they list that as a 1A recommendation, so they're much more aggressive from a stewardship standpoint. If patients have negative cultures, then they, then they, uh, if the patient was hemodynamically unstable at presentation, they recommend continuing the initial broad spectrum antibiotics in case of a cold infection that we're missing. Better safe than sorry, totally agree. They do state that empiric antibiotics can be discontinued after greater than or equal to 72 hours in patients who are hemodynamically stable and a febrile for at least 48 hours, regardless of what their ANC is or how long they're expected to be neutropenic. Um, now, please be aware the, guy, the European guidelines don't assume that we're using fluoroquinolone prophylaxis, and you know, and and they, you know, so, because many often in Europe they're not using it. But they do state that if you were on fluoroquinolone prophylaxis, this is when you would put the patient back on fluoroquinolone prophylaxis. So we're, I would say we're in a transitional period. You know, we're making patient-by-patient patient risk versus benefit decisions, as you should. Uh, also, I should mention that if you de-escalate the patient's antibiotics and they're still neutropenic, the guidelines do recommend the patient be monitored 
inpatient for at least 24 hours before just being discharged in that scenario. So antibacterial prophylaxis, when do we consider it? When we consider fluoroquinolone prophylaxis in patients receiving myelosuppressive chemotherapy, NCC and guidelines um, suggested for intermediate risk, I mean, seven to 10 days of neutropenia, um, and highly recommended for patients at high risk, such as allogeneic stem cell transplant and acute leukemics receiving induction chemotherapy. The IDSA guidelines um, use an ANC less than 100 for greater than seven days and suggest that you might want to consider levofloxacin over ciprofloxacin in patients at high risk for invasive viridin streptococcal infections, a severe mucositis. Um, unfortunately, you know, our strep mitis oralis has, you know, less than a 20% susceptibility to any fluoroquinolone, so that doesn't tend to make a huge difference for us, but it is a thought. I'm going to switch gears from bacteria and talk a little bit about um, Pneumocystis gervecki, which, you know, is a fungus, um, right? Fungal infection produces a diffuse ground glass pneumonia in lymphopenic patients. Uh, it's a major cause of morbidity and mortality in immunocompromised patients, um, uh, particularly in the absence of prophylaxis, which is extremely effective at preventing this complication. Um, the kind of most common drug that we use is, is Bactrim, right? We use a single strength or a double strength daily or a double strength three times a week or any number of odd combinations that give at least three, equivalent of three double strength tablets per week, right? Um, alternatives into, include Atovaquone, which also will give you toxoplasmosis prophylaxis if your patient's uh, sulfa intolerant, Dapsone, unless they're G6PD deficient, um, and pentamidine via nebulization. And the treatment of choice is going to be um, it's going to be Bactrim at high dose, usually 15 to 20 mg per kg per day, three to four divided doses for 14 to 21 days. Um, most of the data with HIV is 21 days. Most of the non-HIV data supports 14 days. And uh, consider um, a prednisone taper um, based on arterial blood gases. And this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's fair. I mean, it's, it's certainly. Sure, sure. I mean, it, yeah, it is. It is. It is. It is somewhat anecdotal. Though. That that is that that is fair. Um, this is the NC uh, example of the NCCN guidelines I mentioned before, right? This breaks down those patients who should receive antinumocystis prophylaxis. So our allogeneic stem cell transplant patients, um, our allogeneic stem cell transplant patients, patients getting alemtuzumab, which is a which if you really hate lymphocytes, is a great drug to give, right? Because it um, um, also some newer information about a, a Dusilib plus or minus rituximab. Certainly patients are, who are getting prolonged corticosteroids uh, in the, at least cancer patients getting prolonged corticosteroids, that, that, that's defined as the equivalent of prednisone 20 milligrams per day for, for greater than 30 days. Or receiving temozolomide plus concurrent XRT. Um, and consider it for other other scenarios like purine analog therapy, um, possibly autologous stem cell transplant therapy. Fungal pathogens. I've got an entire lecture that I, have, I struggle to get done in an hour um, on just talking about fungal pathogens. So I'm only going to have time to hit uh, Candida and Aspergillus as, as two of the more common ones, and only in a very cursory fashion, right? But risk factors for invasive for invasive fungal infections, prolonged severe neutropenia, and profound um, lymphopenia. So be aware, disseminated candida infections um, in some series, um, candidemia can ac account for up to a fifth of positive bloodstream infections in severely septic ICU patients. This is not specific to oncology, right? Um, we can also Historically, um, there were negative blood cultures in 20 to 30% of disseminated candidiasis cases that were diagnosed at autopsy. 
Uh, I think we're getting better at diagnosing. I know we're getting better at diagnosing Canada, but be aware that you can have disseminated candidiasis in negative blood cultures. Um, and risk factors include neutropenia, hemolignancy, poorly controlled diabetes, any kind of immunodeficiency state, high dose steroids, immunosuppressants, any neoplastic, central venous catheter devices, hemodialysis, TPN, prolonged antibiotic therapy, extensive GI tract surgery. So um, just a few things to show on this diagram, right? On the, on the left, you see uh, padic, you know, what we used to call a padic splenic candidiasis, just now known as disseminated candidiasis. We see that Swiss cheese appearance of the liver is caused by uh, neutrophils attacking yeast in the liver. So you won't see that picture in a neutropenic patient, but you might see it post-neutropenia. Um, Canada does not cause pneumonia unless you have disseminated candidiasis causing nodular pneumonia um, in the picture in the upper right. You know, that's more like a septic emboli kind of phenomena. And of course, uh, intraocular infections with, so are often associated with candidemia, something for us to be aware of. Less common in the neutropenic patient population, but still. Yeah. Um, I have not. I Yeah, I'm certainly not saying it couldn't happen because I mean I've 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 seen on the skin, the liver, you know, I mean, but I I, I haven't I haven't seen it. I've I've seen. Yeah, neurosurg I've seen, I mean, I've seen a neurosurgical, uh, very rarely, right. as a neurosurgical yeah. complication. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, why do we care about candidiasis in, in oncology patients? Well, because the high-risk patients can have up to a one in four attributable mortality. Um, antifungal spectrum for Canada. Um, so I, I think it's very important that we're familiar with this, these typical susceptibilities. And so I put like albicans, kefir, dublinensis, tropicalis in one category. They're pretty much susceptible typically to everything. There are exceptions, but um, they're very, very rare in patients who've been on prolonged azoles, for example. Um, Whereas Canada parapsilosis gyro Monday tend to be susceptible to all of our agents, but tend to have a little bit higher MICs against the kind of candens. So rarely you'll see one breakthrough in a kind of candon. Canada lusitanea is intrinsically resistant to amphotericin. Canada galbrata um, likes to create efflux pumps, right? So you can have fluconazole um, sensitive dose dependent, where you can wrap up your dose and still overcome it. Um, some of the fluconazole resistant. Some of these efflux pumps can also pump out other azoles. So for example, you know, yes, you might be able to use voriconazole to treat Canada galbrata, um, but you'd want to have the susceptibilities back before you contemplated that, right? So your kind of cannons are going to be your first line or amphotericin B. And now we're starting to see reports of, uh, of Canada galbrata that's resistant to a kind of cannon. So that's con concerning and probably caused by overuse of a kind of candon therapy. Uh, Canada cruzii is intrinsically um, resistant to fluconazole, but uh, the kind of candons, amphotericin B, are considered first line, but voriconazole um, typically maintains its activity. There are a couple of others to be aware of in passing, right? The Canada fomata um, has 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 been known to pop up and tends to be azole and a kind of candon resistant. Um, so amphotericin tends to be the treatment of choice. Canada oris, I'm not going to get into, but as often multi-drug resistant, you probably have a better chance with the kind of candons than with others, but there are reports of uh, resistant cases there. Switching over to aspergillus, right? This is a ubiquitous mold found in soil, water, and plants, including fumigatus, flavus, niger, and terius. can cause superficial infections, I had a patient uh, fall down, scrape, scrape his knee on sidewalk, get inoculated with aspergillus and have a cutaneous infection in the setting of neutropenia. Um, it's, it can be an allergen. It can cause aspergillomas or fungus balls. It, it can be invasive. 
Um, this is a very old slide, but I keep using it because it demonstrates the, the association between the duration of neutropenia with the risk for invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. So it dramatically rises once you get past about two weeks of neutropenia. Um, diagnosis is ch remains challenging. Um, usually cultures are negative. You can have a positive respiratory culture, which can represent colonization or true infection, depending on the clinical scenario. Um, even if you do uh, biopsy and BAL, you only get about 40% identification tops. Um, we have a couple new tools in our tool belt, right? We have galactomannan, it's a cell wall polysaccharide. Um, it has decreased sensitivity in patients who are on anti-mold anti agents, um, but it can be useful. It's initially approved only for as a serum assay, but now we can do um, um, use it from the BAL as well. And the combination has been has been suge highly suggested to improve our diagnostic yield. Um, it used to be, we used to tell people that you get false positives with uh, Pipersilin Tazobactam. That's not true with the current formulations that are available in the U.S. market. Um, we also have beta-1 3D glucan, which is found in the cell wall of Aspergillus, Canada, Fusarium, and Pneumocystis. This can also be used to test for invasive fungal infection, but it won't specifically tell you you have Aspergillus, although you might have other hints, such as CT scans. Right, so these, so we often wind up in these patients looking at these CAT scans and you know, you see the halo sign, the fuzz around those nodules um, in the top slide, ground glass attenuation, because this is angio-invasive. This is an early sign of aspergillus, and progressively we lose the halo over time. Um, or the air crescent sign down there in the bottom, that's a necrotic area, not seen in neutropenia for the same reasons that I just talked about with the hepatic spent candidiasis. Neutrophils attacking, um, attacking the yeast, uh, attacking the mold in this case. Okay, so aspergillus associated with a high rate of mortality in a variety of patient populations. Basically, the greater the level of immunosuppression, the less likely to recover from the immunosuppression, the higher the mortality. In terms of the spectrum, right, so for, um, so voriconazole um, or isaviconazonium are considered first line for aspergillus fumigatus flavus arterius, um, and Amphiter usually amphotericin B are considered your second line agents. Aspergillus, Aspergillus terius is intrinsically resistant to amphotericin B. Used to be the worst player that we had because we only had amphotericin to treat it with. Um, now it responds as well as anything else to the, to the other azoles. Um, the echinocandins um, are static against Aspergillus, not sidle. I heard someone say that they only, they only heard Aspergillus' feelings. Uh, the uh, this we've also seen some dis disseminated aspergillus ustus infections have reportedly uh, have been reported in allo stem cell transplant patients mostly despite voriconazole or kind of canon prophylaxis and you're going to want to treat with amphotericin B lipid formulations. Okay, running low on time. This is the is this is the study that compared voriconazole to uh, conventional amphotericin B for um, for invasive aspergillosis, and what they found was that uh, voriconazole could be could be used to treat invasive aspergillosis, and 80% of the amphotericin B patients had to be switched to some other therapy because they developed mostly acute kidney injury from the amphotericin B at dose of 1 to 1.5 mg per kg per day. Um, at, perhaps as a result. Voriconazole had a higher success rate at 12 weeks, and most importantly, a higher survival rate at 12 weeks, which is why voriconazole is considered the first-line therapy. Now, we don't know what would happen if it had been randomized to lipid formulations, but the FDA wouldn't have let them do it anyway because they didn't have the FDA indication for first-line therapy. I have a conazonium or crisemba. Um, the take-home message there is we, we now have a, a, another agent which has um, – which and it, which has activity against voriconazole, has some activity against um, against mucor as well, and um, and uh, when compared head to head against voriconazole, what we found was that they were they were absolutely equivalent in terms of efficacy, and crisema might be might have had a modest uh, decrease in terms of uh, cutaneous side effects, visual side effects, pedo, pedobiliary side effects. Also, 
It has a QTC shortening effect, modest, but it's there, so it's not contraindicated in patients with elevated QTC. Um, and it's a less potent 3 or 4 inhibitor than voriconazole or posiconazole, so it has some potential roles there. Um, I don't really have time to get into the emerging molds, things like Fusarium, Cetosporium, the dermatomediaceous molds, or um, Mucor and the Zygomycoses. This is uh, the NCCN guideline talking about uh, antifungal prophylaxis. So patients, um, typically patients with ALL will get fluconazole prophylaxis. Patients um, who are getting induction chemotherapy for MDS or AML will get anti-mold prophylaxis most commonly. Uh, autologous, may, autologous stem cell transplant patients, um, fluconazole prophylaxis, some would say you don't need it if they don't have mucositis. Allogeneic stem cell transplant patients will have antifungal prophylaxis, typically either fluconazole or in a kind of candin. And patients who have severe, significant GBHD requiring high-dose corticosteroids for allogeneic stem cell transplant um, should be considered for anti-mold prophylaxis as well. Okay, I'm going to wrap up with viral infections. Um, and this is the NCCN guidelines recommendations for HSV and VZV prophylaxis. So patients who are at, patients um, who have received standard chemo for solid tumors really typically don't need HSV prophylaxis unless in their day to day life they need HSV prophylaxis. <clears throat> um, patients who are receiving intermediate risk, like seven to ten days of neutropenia, um, consider um, HSV prophylaxis. VZV prophylaxis should also be considered following autologous stem cell transplant. Um, high risk patients, acute leukemics, should get HSV prophylaxis. Patients with proteasome inhibitors, such as Velcade, Bortezomib, should get um, varicella zoster um, prophylaxis. And patients with Alemtuzumab chemotherapy, because of its profound anti lymphocyte therapy for CLL, should get HSV VZV prophylaxis. <coughs> Um, and also be monitored for CMV iremia. Allogeneic stem cell transplant patients, same thing. Same thing with GVHD. Um, I'm not going to discuss herpes simplex virus in infection with you guys because I would assume with this audience that you, you, you got that. Um, cytomegalovirus um, is a, uh, just, just some terms to be aware of. This is predominantly going to be seen in our in our allogeneic stem cell transplant patients or solid organ transplant patients, for example. Um, so CMV infection means there's viral re uh, replication. It's no longer active. We can detect this from CMV DNA by PCR or by antigenemia. CMV disease means we also have symptoms. We also have an organ system that's been affected. This can be generalized like fever, malaise, uh, you can have leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, but you can also have CMV pneumonitis, hepatitis, retinitis, uh, colitis, encephalitis. Uh, it's a major cause of morbidity mort and or mortality after stem cell, solid organ transplant and stem cell transplant. It's interesting to me that the solid organ transplant scenario is different, right? So the highest risk is the negative recipient who receives organs that have CMV in them. But in allogenic stem cell transplant, the primary act issue is reactivation. So the highest risk are those patients who are CMV positive to begin with. It's mostly their own CMV that's reactivated. We use CMV negative or leukocyte depleted blood products for CMV um, negative recipients to avoid giving them uh, CMV. And just as a dramatic example of just how bad CMV pneumonitis can get, right? We treat CMV viremia in these patients to prevent this. Okay. Treat, we treat with gancyclovir. Um, which we have to worry about myelosuppression just, just for real insufficiency. Um, CMV resistance is rare for previously untreated patients, but becomes more problematic in patients with recurrent CMV infections, reactivations. And we have a 60% a, a bioavailable valid gancyclovir for oral formulation. Foscarnet, um, we worry about nephrotoxicity, electrolyte wasting, general ulcerations, it's give pre and post hydration just doses for renal insufficiency, no oral options, primarily used in those patients who are neutropenia at the time of the infection or have gancyclovir resistant disease. I think most of us are going away actually from the use of aminoglobulins, even for CMV, um, CMV pneumonia in allergenic stem cell transplant patients. That data really came from the from 1988 
in small, small numbers of patients. Um, so we typically, um, I would not use oral gancyclovir, not a fan. Uh, there are some solid organ transplant regimens that do extremely poor bioavailability, which is why I use a gram three times a day. Um, Valgancyclovir, we don't typically use it prophylactically, maybe secondary prophylaxis for those patients with the previous um, uh, history of, of activation. Mostly we're going to, we're going to monitor the CMV um, PCR and treat as needed with um, typically valgancyclovir. Okay, and I had mentioned before allogeneic stem cell transplant patients um, and uh, patients receiving CAMPATH are our primary cancer patients that we are concerned about seeing to be involved in. Okay, well, I appreciate your guys' time and attention. Um, take any questions that you might have at this point. Thank you very much.